Hello, Eric here. I came across an interesting topic on Reddit recently. Um, if you want to find me there, I'm triabolical underscore. Um, and the topic was about the Delta IV and why the Delta IV used hydrogen engines. And I thought that was kind of an interesting topic. Um, why do we sometimes see engine choices that look kind of confusing? So uh, I have two that I'm going to talk about. The first is Delta IV. Um, why does Delta use the uh, Hydrolox, liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, RS-68 engine? And also, why did Vulcan uh, decide, or why did ULL, ULA decide to use the methane, liquid oxygen, BE4 from Blue Origin on, on the Vulcan? So. Um, start by talking about the Delta. So the Delta has been around forever. Um, it was originally came out of uh, the missile world. And this is the Delta II. And we can see um, it has uh, an engine called the RS-25A. Um, this is kind of a small, small to medium uh, Carolox engine. So RP-1 slash kerosene and liquid oxygen. And it has that at the bottom. Um, at the top, in this version, it has a hypergolic second stage. So fuels that ignite on contact. Um, that's one of the reasons you can tell this is kind of old. And then it has a third stage that is a solid rocket booster from Morton Thiokol. And it needs to be third sta three stages because neither of these stages are really great. But Delta II was a pretty good launcher. And then they have strap-on solid rockets at the base to give them a little bit more power. Now, we can compare this. Obvious comparison is compare this to the SpaceX Merlin. Uh, it is also a RP-1 liquid oxygen or Carolox uh, engine. Um, it has a little less thrust, the Merlin does, but it has a little better specific impulse. So it's a little more efficient of an engine, but they are roughly in the same class, not that, not that big a part. Now, one of the things you can notice, uh, you know, the Falcon 9 has nine of these Merlins, and the Delta II only has one of these uh, RS-27s. So you can figure out that this is a, a much smaller launcher than the Falcon 9. Now, McDonnell Douglas wanted to uh, do a better version of that, and that ended up being the Delta III. Now, you notice the label now says Boeing, so this is after Boeing acquired McDonnell Douglas, and they came up with this configuration called the Delta III, which is the Delta III, uh, Delta II bottom, so what they had before, with a uh, new stage on top, and the new stage is a liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, I'm using the very popular RL-10 engine, which is still a very popular engine. And this was a way to essentially make their second stage uh, much nicer, um, give them better performance and simplify things. Um, unfortunately, the Delta III was not very successful. In the first three launches, um, it failed twice, and then it had a partial failure in the third launch. So this wasn't really a long-term way that Boeing wanted to go. Then in 1994, we ended up with this new project uh, out of the Department of Defense, out of the Air Force, called the, called the Evolved Expendable Launch Vehicle. And basically, the Department of Defense wanted something instead of the Delta II, Atlas II, and Titan IV rockets that had been used. And they were looking for reducing costs. They wanted uh, standardized fairings. So have the, the same fairing across all the launchers. So they could uh, end up easily switching things around. And they wanted uh, better stuff all around, just better vehicles. So a bunch of different companies bid on this, on the first EELV uh, part. And... Boeing decided to bid on it, so they needed an entry. And the first question is what engine to use. 
And this is where uh, I really wanted to talk. Re the real reason I wanted to do the video is that there's this um, misunderstanding that when you're designing a rocket, you choose a fuel and then you choose an engine. And for a company like Boeing, that is not true. Boeing doesn't make engines. Uh, so they can't just say, hey, we want an engine for this fuel. What they are limited to is the engines that are out there. So let's think about, they're in the case, they have this Delta II, um, they want to do something bigger, what engine are they going to use? And when you want to answer these questions, there's this wonderful page on Wikipedia called the Comparison of Orbital Rocket Engines. And it'll list a whole bunch of different engines for different countries and their statistics and whether they're active and all of those sort of things. So great reference for this sort of question. So ideally, what would they want? Well, they would want an RP-1 engine for efficiency. Um, ideally, they'd want something that's kind of like the RS-27A, but maybe higher thrust. Now, the reason you want to stay with RP-1 is it's a better choice for boosters. Um, I'm going to put a link in the upper right to another talk I did on choosing fuel for boosters and why one is better and why uh, one choice is good and other choices aren't. RP-1 is a very good choice. So let's see what options they might have. Well, they might be able to cluster RS-27As. Um, that's maybe an option. The, the question is, so they're buying these from Rocketdyne or perhaps Aerojet Rocketdyne. Um, I'm not sure whether the merger happened, uh, but they're buying them uh, commercially at the time. And it's not clear whether Rocketdyne wants to keep making these. This engine has been around for a long, long, long time, and they might want to be focusing on other more advanced engines. So uh, this might not be a case. Uh, maybe you actually can't get them, or maybe they're going to be more money than you had hoped. So that's one candidate. Maybe we could do it, maybe we couldn't. What other engines might we use? So RP-1, first stage engine. Well, here's one. Um, the F-1 engine that powered the Saturn V. And it'd probably be an F-1A if you were trying to do something with it. Um, the problem is the F-1A is a big, 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 big engine. It's about eight times the thrust of the RS-27A. So it's a really big engine. Um, I say far too big. Maybe you could build a vehicle that used this. Um, the other problem, um, these aren't actually commercially available. Um, nobody is making them now, and nobody has made them since uh, the time Saturn rockets were being built. So you'd have to pay and get someone to kind of rebuild this. So that seems like not a very good uh, option. So what are your other candidates? Well, guess what? There aren't medium-sized Carolox engines made in the U.S. at the time. They just don't exist. The U.S. manufacturers um, had the existing engines, and all of their research went towards building hydrogen-oxygen engines. Um, so we really don't have this choice here. So what happened? Well, Rocketdyne has this engine called the RS-68. This is intended to replace, not replace, but be uh, an alternative engine to the RS-25, the space shuttle main engine. Now, the RS-25 is a very expensive, very advanced, very high performance engine. Um, not really the kind of thing you'd want for an expendable booster uh, like they are contemplating building, but uh, Rocketdyne was willing to build this. Now, when you go and read about this, they'll always say it's a simpler variant of the RS-25. Um, it's really not a variant of the RS-25. So the RS-25 is a staged combustion engine, very advanced. This is a gas generator engine, uh, very different design. Um, the RS-25 uses a nozzle that uh, is regeneratively cooled, means you put the propellants through uh, to cool the nozzle. Um, the RS-68 has an ablative nozzle. You notice it just looks like carbon. It just gets hot. So really a very, very different engine. So Boeing decided to switch to this engine and therefore to switch to a liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen first stage. And the reason I put decided to in quotes is this really wasn't their first choice. 
But you look around and say, what engines are we going to use? And guess what? There aren't a lot of engines, uh, especially if you want something in a timely manner. So the uh, Delta IV shows up and it runs on these engines on the RS-68. And so Delta IV ends up with multiple variants. The two on the left um, have a four meter uh, fairing, a four meter payload fairing. The three on the right have a five meter fairing. Um, I'm really not sure why they decided to do that. It probably cost a lot extra to be able to do both, but uh, that was their decision. Um, you notice they still use additional uh, boosters on the first stage. And one of the reasons you do that is uh, hydrogen, oxygen first stages do not have a lot of thrust. So guess what? You often need a little boost there. And then finally, they built on the right, uh, the Delta IV Heavy. And this is using what's called a common core approach. So we have the first stage and we can duplicate it and put it on the side. And this was one of the goals of the EELV program, uh, one of the specific specifications or suggestions. We want you to build a normal version and then build a version uh, that's a heavy lift version that can do that. So, just a quick little bit of about the Hydrolox first stage. So, here are two rockets. We have the Delta IV Heavy and the Falcon Heavy, and they look fairly similar. They're fairly similar in concept. Both have this common core. Both have these two boosters on the side. Um, you'll notice that the Delta IV Heavy is a little bigger. Uh, its cores are 5 meters across. Uh, the the uh, Falcon 9 ones are 3.7 meters. So I tried to scale these roughly, so they're roughly uh, real scale. So you'd look at that and you'd say, hey, Delta IV is a bigger vehicle. It should have better performance. Well, guess what? Um, the Delta IV payload to low Earth orbit is about half of what the Falcon Heavy is. Falcon Heavy does better because it uses RP-1 in its first stage rather than hydrogen in its first stage. Now, to be fair, um, the upper stages uh, also use the same propellants as the first stages, and Delta IV Heavy uh, is better proportionally going to geosynchronous orbit because that high performance helps in the upper stage. Um, but uh, it's kind of a challenge. So that is why Boeing made that choice for Delta IV. Um, they needed an engine, they looked around, and guess what? They have the RS-68. So let's move to the second discussion and talk about Vulcan. And there are actually two interesting engine choices here. Um, we need to start back uh, with the Atlas II from Lockheed Martin. And this is a very, very successful launcher. So this is based upon the Atlas missile, um, 63 launches, 63 successes with the Atlas II. Um, hard to do better than that. It uses an RS-56 engine, which is actually derived from the RS-27 engine used in the Delta. Uh, so we see a lot of cases where you see the lineage, you have an engine that works and you just adapt it to your new usage rather than building new engines, because building new engines is really expensive and it takes a long time. So this Atlas II still uses what I would call an interesting booster staging approach, um, first brought in by the original Atlas missile. And over here on the right, you see the silver portion. Uh, the silver portion is kind of the bottom of the tank and the bottom of the main body. And this uh, part below it, the white part down to the engines, is the booster part. Now we have three engines across for the booster part. Two of the engines, the two outer engines, are booster engines. So they're kind of all hooked up. All their plumbing is inside that lower white kind of skirt is what it looks like. And the way this stages is you actually uh, just detach that skirt. Um, the booster engines have stopped. The one in the center is still burning and you detach it and it kind of slides off some rails to the back. Um, this seems like a very 
risky way of doing it, but as I said, 63 launches, 63 successes. But anyway, you know, uh, Lockheed was looking at something maybe a little more advanced. So they needed a better engine too. And remember what I said from Delta? Uh, there's no medium-sized Carolux engines made in the U.S. Hmm, made in the U.S. So we can go back to the orbital rocket engines. And it turns out that when the U.S. rocket makers, rocket engine makers, shifted over to building hydrogen oxygen engines. One of the reasons they did it was they didn't think they could build advanced engines that burned RP-1. And this is because doing what's called a stage combustion engine with RP-1 means you have to deal with very hot oxygen. And very hot oxygen likes to burn, well, pretty much everything. So it's very hard from a material perspective to develop such an engine. Um, the Russians put in the effort, and it was difficult, but they managed to come up with an engine. And they built an engine called the RD-170. Uh, they built this originally for their big Energia booster, which only flew a couple times. The interesting thing about this engine, and I say engine even though you see four nozzles, and one of the problems with big engines is the combustion inside a big nozzle is hard to get uh, to be uh, consistent. You get combustion instability. And in fact, that F1 engine I showed you earlier um, had severe problems with combustion instability. And they literally fought against that for years until they got it working. Um, the Russians took a different approach. They said, well, if big nozzles, big combustion chambers are unstable, we'll just put multiple combustion chambers on it. So we have one set of turbo pumps, one set of equipment, and then four nozzles. So they built this one. Um, that's a pretty big engine. And then they built this second engine, which is an RD-180. So two nozzles, smaller turbo pumps. And then ultimately, they built the single turbo pump version. Um, the RD-191 is the most recent one of those. These are the best booster engines ever made. RP-1 is the best fuel, and these are the best RP-1 engines ever made. I don't think anything comes close to them. So, turns out that Lockheed Martin actually agreed and the Russians had a bunch of RD-180s and they were willing to make more. So uh, Lockheed Martin did kind of a strange thing. They said we're going to build a launcher to launch US government payloads and we're going to use a Russian engine to do it. So that's what they did and that gave us the Atlas V. So we end up with an RD-180 um, we still have this approach of putting extra SRBs around the outside. And the reason we see that is uh, these big single engines are expensive when you're buying them from somewhere else. And rather than go with multiple engines, it's much easier to augment your payload a little bit by adding these solids. So this was a very, very successful launcher. This launched uh, under the EELV program, this launched the vast majority of the U.S. government payloads. It's high performance, very reliable, and it's kind of cheap. And I say kind of cheap compared to the Delta. Um, the Delta was fairly expensive compared to the Atlas V, and the Delta for heavy was very expensive, something on the order of 400 plus million dollars. And part of that is uh, Boeing just did not make very many of either of them. There was also, you remember I talked about uh, Delta IV Heavy, there was actually a, an Atlas V Heavy, and this shows up as a concept. Um, they never actually built it. Um, there really wasn't a need. If you could uh, use the Delta IV Heavy, Atlas V Heavy really didn't help that much. But there's a problem. Um, the Russian engine was bad, and it wasn't bad in any technical or performance sense. Um, it was bad because launching uh, U.S. payloads using a Russian engine was problematic from a political standpoint. 
um, because of some of the things going on in Russia. And there's this continual kind of going back and forth where uh, Congress wants to stop using the RD-180, but the DOD would like to keep launching their payloads. So they keep going back and forth and their bans and then their no bans and approval for some new engines, but not all engines. So this was problematic for what is now known as ULA. And ULA is this, well, I guess, bastard child of the Atlas team from Lockheed Martin and the uh, Delta team from Boeing. And someday I'll do a video that talks about why they ended up together in this joint venture. But anyway, now we have ULA. And ULA had problems. So they have the Atlas V and they have the Delta IV. And that means they have two rockets. And two rockets is one too many. Uh, two rockets means two factories, two assembly lines, two launch pads, two teams. And that is really hard from a fixed cost perspective. Um, you would much rather have one rocket that you fly 10 times a year than two rockets that you fly each of them five times a year. So they wanted to do something about that. Um, and as I said, the RD-180 was so problematic politically. So we have the Atlas V has this political problem. The Delta IV has this cost problem. Um, what are they going to do? And they came up with this new rocket called Vulcan. And the idea is we're going to replace Atlas V and Delta IV. Um, it's really more Atlas V derived with a single vehicle. So we end up with the Vulcan, and it looks pretty much like you'd expect. Um, engines at the bottom, solid rocket boosters, and then the very popular Centaur engine on the top, which is what Atlas used. And Centaur has been around for 50 plus years. So it's a good high performance stage. And then once again, we run into the usual problem. What engine are we going to use? Hmm. Well, there actually is an interesting option. You can stick with the RD-180. Um, it turns out there's a company called United Technologies who has a license from the Russians to build RD-180s in the United States. Okay, that sounds like a great option. Unfortunately, uh, United Technologies says, yes, we could do this. It would take us five years and it would cost a billion dollars. And all of a sudden that looks like a, a much less exciting sort of approach. Now the Air Force had been trying to find a way around the RD-180 for a while, and they'd even given some money to Aerojet Rocketdyne, and they'd started developing uh, a, an engine called the AR-1. And if you look at this, guess what? This looks very much like a clone of the RD-180, uh, even down to the fact that it has two combustion chambers. So this seems like an option. And this was really what most people expected ULA to choose. Seems like it's the, the same fuel choice. You don't have to redesign that much. And uh, obviously Aerojet would be a good company to go with because they have all this long-term history. But there's this other option. Um, Blue Origin is making this methane, liquid methane, liquid oxygen, or methalox engine called the BE-4. And they are willing to sell it. And so this becomes another option. And ULA ends up choosing the BE-4 uh, to a very surprised, uh, uh, very surprised audience. Most people were very shocked when this happened. And I suspect there are really two things driving this. Um, the first is that I think ULA expected the BE-4 would be cheaper and that Blue Origin might give them better service. Now, whether that's happened or not is uh, still up for grabs. Obviously, Vulcan has not flown yet, uh, and the BE-4 has been delayed, but engine design is always hard, and delays are really common. Um, the other thing I kind of suspect um, that I don't have any real proof for is that Vulcan felt both that the AR-1 would be expensive, but they also felt that uh, Aerojet Rocketdyne might not actually be up to designing this engine and getting it working well. 
because Aerojet Rocketdyne has not done a lot of engine development, especially RP-1 engine development, for years and years and years and years and years. Um, so, you know, you can look at their, their history and say, well, they should know how to do this, but the engineers that knew how to do this sort of design uh, probably retired long ago. You know, they worked on the space shuttle. So I think that's why Vulcan ended up going with Blue Origin. So this is another case, you know, uh, ULA, they need a new engine for Vulcan and what are their choices? And guess what? There aren't very many choices. And you probably don't end up with the choice that you really would want. So, quick summary. Companies like uh, Lockheed Martin and Boeing or ULA, um, they don't make engines and they're kind of stuck with whatever engine companies are willing to make. You, know, you can't say, hey, I'm going to use this engine that meets my needs perfectly. The new space companies that we look at make their own engines. You know, obviously SpaceX, the Merlin and Raptor, Blue Origin, B3, B4, it keeps going. Rocket Lab, the Rutherford Curie, uh, Relativity, the Eon 1 and R, Firefly, the Reaver and the Lightning, and Astrospace, the Delphin and the Ether. And the reason they make their own engines is they get to choose the fuel and they get to choose the engine size so they can make an engine that is actually tuned for their vehicle. There's also another really, really important reason why they make their own engines, and that's because they can afford them. Um, if you're in a new space company making your own engine, your goal is to make an engine as cheaply as possible. If you are a company like Aerojet Rocketdyne, your goal is to make an engine that is absolutely as expensive as possible while still being sold. So that means if you are stuck buying engines from a company like Aerojet Rocketdyne, they are going to be very expensive. And if you look across the engines they currently provide, they are all very expensive. Um, a little engine like the RL-10 might be anywhere from 15 to 20, 25 million. And if you've looked at the RS-25 engines, they are recreating for SLS, you will see they are in the hundreds of millions per engine. So that is why the new space companies all make their own engines. Um, they simply uh, have to financially. So thanks for your attention. Hope you found this interesting. Uh, please subscribe.